heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, Meta, it's taken on Twitter. Threads officially hits the App Store and more than 30 million people have signed up already. We'll bring you the details of the launch. Plus, as Elon Musk grapples with competitors to Twitter, he's agreeing to a truce with China's top automakers. We'll have more on the pledge Tesla and others have agreed to maintain fair competition in the world's biggest EV market. And we'll have an exclusive conversation with the CEO of Japanese robotics firm. It's AI-driven Tell Existence. SoftBank backs the company in just raising $170 million for its Series B funding round. All that and so much coming up. But let's focus on these markets because the exuberance on threads is not being reflected by the lack of exuberance in the markets today. We're currently off by 1.3% on the Nasdaq. A pullback. We're worried about basically good news being bad news, Ed. We're looking at jobs growth. Really strong numbers from the private sector when you're looking at ADP. The jobless claims still looking at the strength here of a labor market in the US. The Federal Reserve still going to wanting to be tackling that. MSCI Country World Index on the downside as well. And in fact, we've seen Europe sell off hard. So too has China. So really a global risk off field to trade today and it means that money is actually though interestingly coming out of the bond market sending yields up some 10 basis points on the two-year we saw of course eclipse more than five percentage points as an overall yield for two-year debt at the moment as we think that the fed is going to have to tackle this really strong market and overall economy here in the united states let's move on and what's happening in terms of the world of bitcoin because that risk asset have been higher in fact we topped the 31,000 level the highest in at least eight months but now we come back down to earth a little bit we're off by two tenths of a percent we're still above that 30,000 level overall, Ed. Yeah, when we look at the public markets, there's not, excuse me, a lot of green to talk about. That's how excited I am. But Tesla is a downside mover, 2.2%. We will go to our reporter later in the program here on Bloomberg Technology. It's all about agreeing with domestic Chinese EV makers to normalize pricing. A very interesting move. But that stock down in line with the broader market. One big name we're watching is Meta. Meta, formerly known as Facebook and all about threads. It's been really interesting. Right at the open, Meta was up more than 1.3%. It's kind of chopped traded. We're now down two tenths of 1%. Analysts kind of somewhat bullish on this move with threads. The headline, as you said, Caroline, 30 million users signed up. Let's get more details on threads day one with the Bloomberg technology editor who literally wrote the book on Instagram, Sarah Fryer. Sarah, what do we know about threads day one? Well, it's just been an incredible amount of enthusiasm. I think this is the first time Meta has done a coffee cut product that people are actually hankering for. Everyone was looking for an alternative to Twitter, given all the turbulence from Elon Musk, including over the weekend with rate limiting people who are posting on Twitter, trying to limit the number of tweets they could see. There was a lot of searching for an alternative. And, and Threads is, is seeming to build that critical mass that people need if they want to post something that could have impact. And we're seeing very high engagement. Um, you know, 30 million users, as you said, just blew up over night and this is this is a really exciting moment in the rivalry between Twitter and Meta mm -hmm. I, I just think you know we're, we're a couple decades into that now and and it, it's been really incredible to see um, you know this is the moment of all the times that Meta could have copied Twitter uh, I don't know that it would have worked until now this timing seems to be really painful probably on Twitter's part, as you say, amid the swirling chaos of limitations to certain numbers of tweets that you can see. Sarah, to that point, Twitter's response, Linda Yaccarina, we're going to dig into that later in the show, has been responding to all of this. But ultimately, what does 30 million look like in comparison to historical levels of growth? 
Well, it, it's, it's a big start for a new social media app. And I think the reason that it is getting so much enthusiasm is because it has that existing connection to the Instagram network. Now, that's also been a point of frustration for Threads users, people who don't use Instagram or who don't like their Instagram handle or haven't invested in that platform or have a different community there than they have on Twitter. They're not exactly excited to copy that over to a new app where they want to build a new identity. However, it has made it a lot easier for those key users, the, the celebrities, the public figures, the brands, th those that use uh, Instagram already for professional reasons, wanting to port over all of that influence to an app uh, without having to start from scratch. And, and that's really a, a big motivator. So if everyone else wants to follow those people, and Threads becomes the place to do it, I, I think we're going to see those, those issues work out over time. But mm -hmm. of course, Instagram is going to try to deal with some of the pain points as they can. JLo, Paris Hilton, many a funny post coming from them already, I'm sure, joyous for those that have been overseeing the launch. Bloomberg, Sarah Fry, thanks for that update. Meanwhile, let's just dive into the conversation, also perhaps some of the financial drivers that obviously follow success. Jasmine Enberg, I'm pleased to say, is right here in New York. She, of course, leads coverage of influencer marketing and social commerce at Insider Intelligence. You focus on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook. Let's focus on threads first because... Well, it looks like it's going well. What do you think is the monetization angle ultimately here for the investors that are listening to us? Because I've seen already Zuck post about monetization not coming immediately. Absolutely. Well, just to put this into perspective, I mean, 30 million users is an incredibly strong start. At Insider Intelligence, we're expecting Twitter to have about 56 million users in the U.S. by the end of 2023. So that just gives you some context for how many people Threads was able to um, have sign up just overnight. In terms of the monetization, monetization, ads are Meta's bread and butter. And I would assume that any monetization strategy for Threads would include advertising. That said, I'm expecting that Meta will wait until Threads really reaches scale before they bring on any sort of monetization opportunities. Zach himself saying, look, mm -hmm. we want to get to a billion here. How quickly do you think they can scale to a billion? And is it really a, a, the area, the focus, the number you want to see? Well, I mean, Meta obviously has a scale, it has the resources, it, and it has the execution strategy to, to scale threads. I do think, you know, the challenge will be in keeping up the momentum that we saw yesterday and that continued into this morning. You know, it is a new app, and there are very few new, uh, new apps that are able to keep up that growth rate that um, threads has seen already. And I also think that, you know, Meta will have to continue innovating, will have to keep threads interesting. Right now, its simplicity and its bare bones UX are some things that really are attractive to users, especially those that are tired of the chaos and the ad hoc changes mm -hmm. at Twitter. Um, but eventually it is going to have to innovate to keep people engaged and, and on the app. And as many would say, innovation is Elon's strong point and Linda Yaccarino, Ed, brings, well, the monetization strategy for Twitter as well. But you've been tracking ultimately how the growth of threads compares, right? Yeah, and, and I'm interested, Jasmine, in, in the mechanics of how they got threads off the ground. You have to have an Instagram account. And what I did was I went through Twitter's S1 back in 2013, and they hit 30 million users at the start of 2010, sort of four years into the life of, of the platform. This link with Instagram seems to have given them a fast start. What's your assessment of that? I think it was incredibly smart. Um, it was really easy to sign up for Threads. You could port your Instagram account. You could port your Instagram followers directly onto Threads. I think there are some people who don't necessarily want to transport their um, Instagram followers, their audiences over to this new app and want to keep these two separate. Um, but I, overall, in, in order to sort of supercharge the growth, I think this was a, a spot on move from Meta. Jasmine, what, what's your experience been? using the platform, what do you like about it? I mean, it's been really easy to use. The user interface has been fantastic and it's been fun so far. I don't know how long that will last, but for now it feels like an early Twitter 1.0 with an Instagram twist, some more photos and, and visuals on, on the platform. I haven't left Twitter yet though. I'm still on both, which just means that there are more apps now than ever to, to post exactly. on. <laughs> and we are kind of all ex a bit exhausted by it, Jasmine, to a certain extent. One group, of people who aren't going to be exhausted by threads is Europe because it's not there yet. We understand the regulatory overhang. 
What do you make of that, well, delay? Is it opportune for Meta to push back against regulators in Europe? Well, it's certainly going to be a challenge for Meta. I mean, Meta needs to convert one in four Instagram users in order to make threads as big as Twitter is worldwide at the end of this year. Europe is a really big market for them, and it's going to be um, a challenge. It's going to be an issue if it's not able to launch there. Now, some of the reasons that you know it has delayed the launch of threads, potentially being the DMA, are issues that will affect all of the social apps. It's not just Threads and it's not just Meta, but it does point to this larger picture of how difficult it is really to bring new apps and, and products to market. Let's go back to the technology. There is an algorithmic and machine learning powered uh, part of each feed. What is your assessment of which is better, Twitter or Threads at this point? Well, I, I think it certainly depends. You know, Threads is very new, and I haven't had a lot of time to, to tinker around with it. I think what's really interesting and what I've been thinking a lot about is how people are going to be using Threads. Are they actually going to be using it for the same use cases as we were using Twitter or continue to use Twitter, meaning keeping up with news and world events? Now, news has been somewhat of a sore spot for Meta on its other platforms, Facebook in particular. Um, and I'm not sure that you know the Instagram usage translates naturally into news and world events the same way that it does on Twitter. I don't necessarily think that Meta needs to, to be as strong a player in those arenas, though, to make um, threads, a, a real threat to Twitter as it is. Insider Intelligence Principal Analyst Jasmine Emberg. Day one of threads done. Let's see what happens next. All right, still ahead. Let's go from threads to robots. Our exclusive conversation with the CEO of a soft bank robotics company just raised $170 million for a Series B. This is Bloomberg Technology. Let's get out to Japan. Tokyo-based robotics startup Telexistence has just raised $170 million for its Series B funding round, backed by SoftBank and other big names. Joining us now for more is the co-founder and CEO of Telexistence, Jim Tomioka, in an exclusive interview. Uh, good evening, I suppose, to you, Mr. Tomioka. Thank you for joining us. It's big Series B. What do you need this money for in your robotics? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me today. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we, we raised the $170 million from the soft bank group and the other and Fox and the other investors. And the, mainly, we're going to use this capital to uh, expand to the U.S., uh, uh, United States. Foxconn, an investor, but I'm really interested in that relationship. Are they going to help you scale and manufacture your robotics? Correct. So right now in Japan, we are in the process of deploying the 300 robots to the convenience stores. And we see the strong demand in Japan because, you know, we are facing the aging issue, labor shortage. So we, we aim to increase our manufacturing capacity to 3,000 uh, next year. And in order for us to do that, we, we, we think, you know, we best work with the folks from to manufacture the robot outside Japan. Jin, what's interesting is demographics an issue in Japan. Here in the U.S., the labor data shows there's a real tightness here, too. Are you looking at coming to the United States to alleviate the labor issues here, too? Yes. So we, don't, we, we, are, not, we are not intent to take jobs from people. But as you said, even with the different context, you know, we see there's a big gap between the uh, the labor's necessary and, 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 and labor who, who intends to go back to the market. So we want to fill that gap to solve the labor shortage, especially in retail and logistics using our robots. Already, your partnership with Family Mart, for example, in Japan, across thousands mm -hmm. of convenience stores. There are hundreds of thousands of convenience stores in the U.S. I'm sure you can deploy at. How has the artificial intelligence mania affected the appetite to invest in you? Because these robots are powered by AI. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, yes, so we, we use the uh, computer vision, uh, AI machine learning control the robot. And the, the current, you know, recent um, AI trend, obviously, you know, for, uh, support us to raise the fund. And we do think, you know, the AI is pushing the boundaries of the robot to work more near the humans or everyday people's life. So we want to do that in the space too. Jin, where did this round value your company? What was the valuation? Um, it's a bit hard to disclose, but I think one or two steps before uh, Unicorn. A Unicorn status round. Well, congratulations to you on that. What is your mm -hmm. point of differentiation? What is it technologically that you do differently from the other robotics makers? Caroline was talking about AI. Do you mm -hmm. have a deep foundation in machine learning? Uh, yes. So, you know, we use the AI machine learning to detect uh, every different shape of the product sold in the in, in convenience store so that we can uh, find the optimal grasping point of the every different product and then take it first. But on top of that, because the current AI is pretty limited, so our company's goal is to bring, bring the robot outside factories and try to control them uh, in uh, people's everyday life. So meaning that we, we, we try to control the robot in a more dynamic environment. And the current AI is, cannot really adapt to the environment. So one feature we have is we combine the AI machine learning with remote control, meaning people using the internet to control the robot and fix the, uh, the issue if we face. So that, that, that's the combination of AI and remote control is one feature we have. Jin, it's great talking to you. Thank you for bringing us the story exclusively. Fascinating to see the robotics in the background as well. Jin Tamioko, of course, Telexistence CEO. Meanwhile, Ed, well, you had some big interviews as well exclusively yesterday. Yeah, it's been a busy week so far. Coming up, Rivian ready to take on more commercial partners beyond Amazon. That's after, of course, a recent bout of production success. We'll get to my exclusive interview. There we are with the CEO next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Electric vehicle maker Rivian's had a bit of a rebound of late. A technology fix on its EV pickup and SUV helped Rivian beat on production in the second quarter and the companies started shipping delivery vans to Europe for its biggest investor, Amazon. I traveled to the company's HQ in Southern California to sit down for an exclusive conversation with the founder and CEO, RJ Scarange. We have a quad motor set up in our R1 vehicles. It's two motors per axle, so four motors per vehicle. And we've just launched a dual motor setup, which leverages a, a new motor family, which we call the Enduro motor family. And that Enduro is completely built in-house, the rotor, the stator. Of course, just like on the, the launch configuration, we build the inverter in-house, the gearbox in-house. But when we sourced the, the power semis for the inverter in, in Enduro, we sourced in a really thoughtful way that gave us enough capacity and much more confidence around that supply chain than some of the challenges we've had on the launch configuration. And so that not only provides a high confidence production uh, capacity on the Enduro, but it also provides risk mitigation on any shortcomings in terms of supply on the quad motor. The other big news of the, the last five days is that you have, you're out of the United States. Yeah. A small number of Amazon EDVs, electric delivery vans, are being shipped to Europe, Germany, in the yeah. first instance. Yeah. Why was that a significant milestone? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's important to get those vehicles there. Amazon has a lot, of, uh, a lot of business in Europe, but it also represents not just turning on production of vehicles that get shipped overseas, but all the supporting infrastructure. So we have parts distribution capabilities, we have service capabilities, and the, the EDV program is really a, a wonderful way for us to open those markets with highly predictable and planned service intervals and delivery intervals. So it's the beginnings of us opening up the European market for our products. As you know, I, I always ask Twitter, what would you ask, in this case, RJ Scarringe? Lots of people want to know about the Amazon relationship. Mm -hmm. You don't break down production by product type, R1T, R1S, or EDV, mm -hmm. but a lot of people want a sense of how many vans you're yeah. building proportionately to your consumer yeah. products. What is the main part of the business? Over uh, 
If you think about over the over the full year, we, we've guided to roughly 20% of our production is is the commercial vans. Um, you know, as we think about the business going forward, the consumer side of the business will, will grow disproportionately relative to the commercial side, especially as we bring in our, our next generation products with the R2 and the R2 platform, representing a, a significant step up in volume and a much lower price point, much larger adjustable market uh, with that with that product. What is the status of the relationship with Amazon? They have exclusivity, yep. but you would like to sell vans to others in the future. I mean, the relationship with Amazon is outstanding. The uh, the van is loved by the drivers. There's lots of content uh, all over the web on, on just the, the creature comforts we built in, the ease of use, uh, the operators of the vehicles are feeling it, you know, with, with the increased efficiency. Uh, so we've, we've, um, we've done, I think, a really nice job of capturing that feedback as we went through the development process to make sure the van delivered. We're now in the final hopeful stages of negotiating uh, allowing us to sell the vehicle uh, outside of the Amazon relationship to others. So that the exclusivity provisions that were originally built into the contract uh, accelerating when we open that up to be able to sell to, to non-Amazon. My interview, Caroline, with the Rivian CEO, RJ Scaring, and the company, the stock, the factory, has a bit of momentum behind it right now. Yeah, I'm sure it puts a smile on his face. Does the one question you were going to ask him, we talked about it yesterday, is whether he's enjoying himself. And I mean, is yes. he amid some of the turbulence he's experienced? Yeah, and I did ask him. I mean, it's been a really long road for him. He founded the company in 2009, but what was astonishing is they kept in stealth mode till mm -hmm. 2019 without any leaks. Huge IPO 2021, the biggest since Facebook. Um, and then everything kind of went downhill and he said, with a wry smile, yeah, I'm having fun, but it's tough. Mm. Expectedly tough was the, the phrase that he used. Yeah, and as you pointed out, of course, founder CEOs, there are few and far between that managed to ride out the IPO successfully in that way. The future, the guidance, yeah. the area in which now analysts can continue to think that there's yes. opportunities in the stock, what did you think? They didn't restate guidance. I asked him why they didn't upgrade it, but he said our aim is to outperform our own goals. And mm. you look at the numbers, it seems like they'll do that. He's got more help, experienced execs with him. Uh, you know, the big question for him is, is what he's focused on. And without teasing too much, I'll have a little piece coming next week where we'll dig into RJ Scaringe, the person, yeah. and how he deals with things day to day. That should be fun. Wow. It was a great interview. Fascinating backdrop there as well. And I'm loving all the, the video to seemingly everyone's getting their Amazon deliveries in forests and on mountaintops, yeah. but sadly not here in the city. Meanwhile, coming up, let's talk about the EV spectrum in a little bit of a different way, Ed. China, EVs, in particular why Tesla and some of the top EV makers are actually taking a vow to help stabilise pricing in the world's biggest market for those electric cars. We'll have plenty more on the impact on Tesla's stock and overall how BYD and others are signing up to just cool down some of the pricing pressure from New York, from San Francisco, and with a healthy dose of China. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. Let's get a quick check on the markets, Caroline. A lot of red. I'm focusing in on the NASDAQ 100. We're down about a percentage point, 0.97%. All about that private hiring data you were talking about earlier in Bloomberg Technology. The idea being the Fed might have to be more aggressive on hikes to fight inflation, higher rates discount the present value of future cash flows. And that's why we care about it here on Bloomberg Technology. We're down Two days straight on the NASDAQ 100, not a lot of individual movers to the upside. One big drag from a points perspective to the downside is Tesla. The news coming out of China that Tesla, along with a number of producers in China's electric vehicle space, committing to maintain fair and balanced practices within the market, basically to normalize price. A total of 16 automakers, including Tesla, BYD and NIO, signed a pact to rein in, quote, abnormal pricing in the competitive space. Tesla, though, was the only foreign brand in that deal. Joining us with the latest, Bloomberg's David Welch. What do we know about this kind of compromise, David, between all these automakers in China? 
Yeah, it was really interesting to read the highlights of this thing. Uh, among them, reining in uh, marketing actions. Uh, one of them was preserving, uh, what was it, uh, socialist principles or some such. Uh, you know, these are all very vague things that don't set certain prices or say control pricing or it, it, it's almost as if it was written by a bunch of American attorneys who wanted to avoid saying price fixing <laughs> but it is telling everybody okay stop dropping prices and um, look you, you, the government does have a, a great interest in stability here in selling more vehicles but also keeping preserving the health of the companies and you can't do that if everybody's on this big price binge another uh, price cutting binge I should say and another part of it is that you know, consumers really hated this. There were people who were essentially rioting at dealerships because they bought a car and then they saw the price drop a couple of weeks later. So you had some unrest with consumers about this. You have the government wanting everyone to stabilize things. And uh, I think everybody felt a lot of pressure to just kind of cool it and, and find a floor for prices. Uh, and, and end the price war. I mean, it's interesting. The Ministry of Industry and Information Technology directed apparently the Automobile Association to basically get these 16 players together and to sign along to a non binding agreement. But ultimately, how is it for Tesla doing business in China? I think they've struggled to a degree with everybody in the sense that you had this malaise kind of post-COVID hangover uh, that had depressed uh, vehicle sales, had depressed, ec depressed economic activity. It's sort of starting to recover, but everybody's having a tough time there. And I think that's why you saw some of the price cuts to begin with, to basically generate some, some vehicle sales and get people back to dealerships and looking at cars. I, I think the market will recover, but in talking to other automakers who do a lot of business there, General Motors, Volkswagen, you know, they all kind of say the same thing, that it may not get back to the hugely profitable levels they had a few years ago because of increased domestic competition, uh, Tesla having to face off with a, a really strong player like BYD and some others. So I think the, the price levels that we have now, which are down from where they were uh, a couple of years ago, I think that's here to stay. Yeah. And I think everybody's really going to have to fight it out with a lot of serious competition from the Chinese automakers. And look, that's something you can spread globally. Elon Musk has been cutting prices here in the U.S. and worldwide because he's basically said, look, profit is my sacrificial lamb if I'm going to be able to go over market share at the moment. Does it feel like that has won or can he now in China, for example, depend more on new models helping drive forward sales? Well, he's going to have to. And keep in mind, he has cut prices significantly over there and in every market. I, I kind of go back to you know, my first economics class in college. Tesla basically had a monopoly on EVs for most of the past decade. And now that's changing. It's changing in Europe, too, because the European automakers are bringing vehicles out. And the European market tends to be pretty nationalistic in terms of brand loyalty. The Chinese market is starting to look more that way. And there is more competition in the US with Ford, uh, Hyundai, Kia, General Motors selling more electric vehicles. The German automakers are coming on here, too. None of their volumes are really big, but if they if they take 10% of the electric vehicle market this year, they're eating away at Tesla's market share. And if Elon Musk wants to protect that, he's going to have to drop prices, and he has. And he's got the margin to do it. Keep in mind, he sold very expensive vehicles for a long time. You're talking about mid-sized sedans and mid-sized crossover SUVs selling for $60,000, $70,000. That's all had to come down because he doesn't have the only, the only vehicle uh, for sale now. David Welch, another Bloomberg technology editor, Caroline, who literally wrote the book on GM, <laughs> the reinvention of American icon. We just got sales data from GM, David. How, uh, how's that Ultium battery platform and the vehicles that it's attached to going? Slowly. They only sold about 1,400 of them. Uh, in, in, I'm sorry, they sold about 1,400 EVs in the quarter. And uh, it, it's, it's really... It, it, it's been a lot of promise and a lot of slow ramp up with the Ultium vehicles. They're getting their batteries from this plant in Ohio, uh, the Ultium plant there, and that's really not going to be ramping up a lot until the second half of the year. I think they're, they're kind of doing final install of their last line this month in July, and GM has been promising, promising that you'll see much more of the Cadillac Lyric, uh, maybe the Hummer, the Chevy Silverado electric truck, and the Chevy Blazer uh, midsize SUV. You'll see that really coming on in the second quarter, and, and it's because of that plant. Mm. What it all means, Ed, is 
they won't have any excuses anymore in the second half of the year. They're really going to have to show that Ultium is cranking, that they've got the bugs out, that this is the right strategy, that, that spending all this time working on a dedicated electric vehicle battery and platform, not just retrofitting existing internal combustion vehicles like Ford did with the Mach-E and the Lightning, that what GM did is the, the smart way for the long term and that they're starting to show results. And they've had a lot of different fits and starts, and now they really have to get it moving. And this is, you know, I'd say third quarter and fourth quarter are the ones to watch and see if they're really finally executing because they've had serious execution issues with electric vehicles at General yeah. Motors. When the rubber hits the road, David Welch, thank you, the man who wrote the book. Meanwhile, look, let's talk a little bit more about Tesla, the CEO, Elon Musk, of course, actually continuing to caution against the swift development of, you guessed it, artificial intelligence tools. Musk actually headlined a Chinese government-backed conference in Shanghai where he called for more regulatory oversight of AI functions. He also praised China's advances in the field and expressed some confidence that it could become a key global player for the technology, if it's not already. Meanwhile, coming up, we'll take the pulse of the fintech space with venture capital discussion. Cowboy Ventures partner Gillian Williams joining us next. Also, of course, when we think about AI, we've got to think about, well, the publicly traded companies like Microsoft. Analysts at Morgan Stanley, get this, thinking it'll be a $3 trillion company. They've raised the price target to $415, so implying a valuation of about $3.1 trillion. The firm says Microsoft is the best placed in the tech sector to reap those benefits from the growth of generative AI. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. Look at the world of seed investing right now. In particular, fintech and SaaS. We've got our VC spotlight moment, and I'm pleased to welcome Cowboy Ventures partner Gillian Williams, who's been investing in fintech. She says before it was cool. Is it? I'm pleased to say fintech is cool. Always been cool in my heart, Gillian. But tell us a little bit about the environment with which you are currently writing checks. Is it active for you? Seed seems to be an area that's been really resilient. Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me. So I mean, the seed stage market is definitely more resilient, especially compared to the later stage market, but all of it really trickles down. And so while I think this is a great time for new founders and new ideas to be built, we still do have to look at what's happening at the IPO market, the later stage market, and even at like the Series B and Series A markets um, to understand what's happening at the seed market. It's getting harder for a lot of founders that raised in 2020, 2021 to raise their follow-on rounds. And so because of that, VCs are having to spend more time with their portfolio companies and really just kind of re-understand what's really happening with the market right now and understand what valuations that we need to be focused on, uh, what metrics that companies need to hit, because all of that's gone through recalibration at this point. And so that's really important. And so that really has had a trickle down effect in terms of what's happening at the seed stage. Um, so overall, it's definitely more resilient to what's been happening. Yeah. But uh, it's still, we're seeing a slowdown across the entire market. Well, the one area of resilience, of course, has been anything that's had artificial intelligence in its name. What portfolio companies are leveraging that innately and what companies are able to pivot to start to make the most of the sea change in technology? Absolutely. I think that it's become um, definitely a buzzword and uh, something that helps you raise a ton of capital at this point. Uh, and it's something that we are really excited about. Uh, just we think that it's a technology that across all sectors um, is something that whether it's existing portfolio companies or new companies that we're looking at, um, should be thinking about because it can really just expedite the use of data and technology in, in ways that we really haven't thought about before. Um, and so we're really excited about it. And we have two of our portfolio companies um, are, are really innovating in the space. So one actually that's been around for, it's a Series C company called Vic.ai. Uh, they are an accounting company that applies uh, and integrates AI into the accounting process for enterprise software companies. And so what we are most excited about this is especially using private data, and this is something in fintech, why areas that are more regulated like fintech and healthcare will be a little bit slower in our minds to adopt AI. Uh, it's because you're using a lot of private data and the ability to trade some of these language learning models will just take a little bit longer. 
And so with Vic.ai, they've been able to do this over the past few years. And so they're able to continue innovating a lot faster and being able to apply uh, new use cases and new AI models on top of this data that they've already had to continue to improve um, and make their AI software and their platform even more efficient for their customers. So we're really excited about them. Um, and then another one that's actually not in the FinTech space is called CoRISE. They're in the learning development space and they provide expert-led courses to learners to help them develop their skills and level up. And the founder came from Coursera and what they're doing is really using, um, applying AI to their existing platform to help them scale learner and like learners even more so and apply personalization and support in real time. And so that's a great use case of something that wasn't yes. necessarily applying AI and making it even, even faster and better. So we're really excited about that. Gillian, here on Bloomberg Technology and in particular Venture Spotlight over recent weeks, we've been talking a lot about the idea of cerebral valley, that the, the, the kind of energy in AI is here in San Francisco. You're joining us from New York. Where do you see the talent and the opportunity geographically in terms of the, the portfolio companies you have and those you're looking to invest in? Absolutely. So Cowboy Ventures, we are split between Palo Alto and New York. Um, so we do have coverage across the U.S. And for the most part, we focus on the U.S. when we invest. Um, in terms of where our portfolio is split, um, I want to say it's um, it's around 60, 70% West Coast um, and 30, 40% East Coast. But that has definitely continued to evolve. I mean, I think obviously COVID was a huge driver of that, but we continue to see our founders kind of, um, first of all, move around even after we invest, sort of they decide where they want to live, but also yeah. in terms of the talent that they are hiring. And this drive for obviously wanting to cultivate and build an incredible culture of their team, um, but also wanting to make sure that they're able to get the best talent that they can. And so we see a lot of them, maybe in the early days, wanting to all be together, but at the same time, making sure that they can hire the best people, no matter where they are. So oftentimes it's split between New York and the Bay Area. Um, and so we'll do a lot of offsites together and making sure they're getting together at a pretty regular cadence. And so especially for me within the fintech space, a significant portion um, of the companies that I've invested into are on the East Coast. However, we're extremely flexible. We're kind of flying back and forth, and we really take a team approach in terms of our coverage um, on both coasts. Valuations, how do they look to your mind? Absolutely. I think there's, as I mentioned earlier on, there's definitely been every, every calibration. And I think we'll see, unfortunately, a lot of companies that raised over the past few years um, have to level set are for that next round. Um, we've had, we've seen it with some new companies and even had to have some conversations with uh, some portfolio companies that you can hit the metrics that you were told you needed to hit for that next round. And the problem is that the bar has raised. Yeah. And so your expectation of getting that dream valuation might not be real anymore, and Jillian, um, especially for the to metrics that, that you're point, looking. how are they incentivizing their talent? How are they making the most of more talent coming to the market who've been laid off by some of the big tech companies? Absolutely. And so I think there's, there's sort of two different ways. And that's something that is kind of continuing to be talked about um, in terms of how you can incentivize the incredible talent that is now out there. Because actually, it's gotten so much easier to bring in talent now. Um, a year and a half ago, trying to find great talent would have take, like, it was taking months. And you actually have to make decisions so much faster. That was problematic because people were making the wrong decisions. I think that's honestly part of the uh, part of the reason why you're seeing these layoffs grow, and uh, especially with some of the companies. Obviously, there's sort of runway issues, but also they hire too quickly, and so you hire you can't hire the best talent all the time if you're hiring that quickly. Um, and so being able to kind of take your time in terms of hiring is actually a huge benefit. But then also, I've seen some companies where they're actually having conversations, especially with their senior exec team or with the talent that um, is that is their key talent that they want to keep, especially if, let's say, they have to take a down round um, and talk about how they can help make them whole or help incent re-incentivize them or reissue some, some options at the new valuation mm. because of the fact that their stocks may be underwater at this point. And so definitely is more of an art to it. 
but people are really thinking about how to protect their employees. Art and science always in this game. Cowboy Ventures partner Gillian Williams, great to have you on the show. Come back, we hope soon. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, Ed, we've got some more talking tech. Yeah, let's get some talking tech. First up, attacks have spiked significantly in the past six months and pose a vital risk to India's economic ambitions. That's according to a Google Mandiant unit. They say industries from manufacturing to pharmaceuticals are becoming more vulnerable as they digitize operations. In China, Alibaba signed an agreement to work with its home province to develop AI in the digital economy. The development suggests official backing for Alibaba's efforts against a backdrop in recent years of regulatory moves against the firm, plus Daniel Friedberg, FTX's former chief regulatory officer, is now being pulled deeper into the intrigue surrounding his former boss, Sam Bankman-Fried. In a lawsuit filed last week, the new management of FTX accused Friedberg of enabling Bankman-Fried's alleged crime and helping to orchestrate a, quote, wide-ranging con game to raid billions of customer dollars. That's your talking tech. Now, coming up... Mark Zuckerberg takes to Twitter for the first time in 11 years. We'll bring you the why next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Going viral, Mark Zuckerberg posted his first tweet in more than a decade on the day, of course, of Meta's Threads launch. The founder of Meta appears to be making a pretty obvious jab at Elon Musk, posting a popular Spider-Man meme. Meanwhile, Musk responded shortly after with his own retort about Instagram. This comes just two weeks after Musk's Zuckerberg cage fight was first discussed, yet to become a real one. For now, Ed, a figurative one, it's and taking like... place on the various social media platforms. It's like the most accurate use of that meme ever seen. It's episode 19B of the 1967 animated Spider-Man. The title of that episode is Double Identity. And Zuck's point is, they're the same thing. I mean, threads and Twitter, to all intents and purposes, Caro, they're the same. Yeah. And are you enjoying it? I am enjoying it. And I think we better get into like the momentum behind this. Bring in Aisha Counts from Bloomberg Technology. You wrote in the Tech Daily, Instagram's Twitter copycat meets pent-up demand. What's the evidence for that? Well, 30 million people being on threads in That's less than 24 hours is pretty crazy. I don't, I mean, we've seen other Twitter alternatives pop up. I don't think that they had that sort of growth within 24 hours, so it's pretty impressive. Phenomenal growth. How about the way in which we're starting to see things that are popular on Twitter, like polls, like hashtags and all that sort of good stuff? Will that eventually creep in to threads, do you think? You know, I, w I would imagine it's still early. So both Adam Masseri, who is head of Instagram, and then Mark Zuckerberg himself have been posting on Thread and saying, you know, it's still early. We're still planning to add features. I imagine maybe they wanted to roll it out now, take advantage of kind of like where Twitter has been over the past several months under Elon Musk. It's been struggling a bit. There's been things like rate limits and people were not able to get into their Twitter accounts. That they didn't, and it was all sorts of things happening. And so... It's a, it's a good time, I think, for threads to come out, and I think that's evidenced by the amount of people that have signed up in such a short time. Caroline makes a really good point on the functionality. There are clearly UX differences. I was number 132,009 to sign up on threads. What are your takes on the platform? What's, what are the feedback that users have been giving you? Yeah, it's a mix. I think some people are really excited just to have another place to go because maybe they were unhappy with some of the changes on Twitter. Some people are like, well, my Instagram friends are very different than my Twitter friends, and I don't know if it's going to be the same vibe. But I think generally people seem to be optimistic. And yes, it's, it's still early and the features are not there yet, but it does have a lot of the same feel of Twitter. And people are posting and I'm seeing some of the similar conversations that I might see on Twitter. So we'll see what happens next. I've seen some fun memes that I could respond to that brag by Ed about which number he was and the partaking <laughs> on the threads. But Aisha, ultimately at the moment, all, we've heard from Lindy Acarino, we've heard her speak out about that, you know, Twitter is, you cannot duplicate it. Ultimately, what do you think the comeback has to be from Twitter right now? I mean, they say that you can't duplicate it. We do see 30 million people on threads. Time will tell. She didn't name threads by name, but she was kind of hinting at some competition there. And I think Twitter has a road ahead to try to get back advertisers, clean up content on the platform, maybe removing those rate limits. I know that they were temporary, 
but making some of those changes that benefit users, I think that's going to be the key. I wonder how Mastodon and Blue Sky are doing today as well. I have a feeling a few more invitations are suddenly being sent out. I finally got my one for Blue Sky anyway. Asia Counts, <laughs> right. thanks so much. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, yet. Yeah, a real mega show. So much to recap. Check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. In just a few minutes' time, Cara and I taking to Twitter spaces to talk threads. This is Bloomberg Technology.